I plan with this channel is to do multiple series on different topics on economics, obviously. I'm going to cover, in this video, overlapping generations models, which are the fundamental basis for a lot of economic modeling, at least monetary economics. Um, I plan on just doing my entire program at USF, both undergrad and graduate. So that includes the coursework for bachelors of science in quantitative economics and econometrics. And then the MA was just a master of arts in economics um, with different electives that I took that have different applications for different forms of economic modeling, cost benefit analysis, econometrics, antitrust, health economics, and the such. Um, this will be the first video based off of modeling monetary economics textbook. Obviously a link for this will be in the description. Okay, it's not focusing. But it's a book. This is the sixth edition or fifth by Bruce Chapp, Scott Freeman, and Joseph Haslag. We used the fourth edition in my class. This book is slightly updated. Um, it had some more information about cryptocurrencies and newer developments in modern day economies. So I won't follow the book perfectly, but it is a very easy to read book. You don't need to understand typical macroeconomic models to understand this. It kind of lives in its own world. Um, it will help if you have basic understandings of economies, but because this is specifically monetary economics, it doesn't fall into the introductory macroeconomics. Um, you don't need too much math. All the math is very simple. It's mostly theoretical understanding. So what I have here is all the assumptions, axioms, and basic knowledge you have to understand before you can get started in analyzing overlapping generations models. They were first developed by Paul Samuelson in 1958. Uh, he worked with these extensively. I don't know too much econ history, but there is a good amount in the textbook and various other sources you can research. So we use models and economics for everything. And the reason being is you always want to start with the most simple example possible, and then you build from there and make it more and more complicated. So simple is always better in most things in life. And most economies are so complex, modeling them is it's not feasible, and it would be a waste of resources. So that's what I have up here. We use model economies to project from simple to complex. If you understand the simple functions of the economy, you can add more variables in the ceteris paribus fashion, where you hold everything else equal, and you introduce you introduce one new variable at a time, which is how you model most economics. You always do everything under the assumption of ceteris paribus, which is all else things, or holding all else equal. Um, you'll see it as CT or CT in textbooks, and that's what it represents. So I guess we can start with agents' preferences. So in the overlapping generations models, there's two time, you're only alive for two time periods. All the information is here. You, time periods are denoted by subscripts T. So T is this time period. T minus one is the previous time period. T plus one is the future time period. Every agent in this economy only has two periods. You're young and then you're old. And that's it. Um, the number of young born last period is exactly equal to the number of old in this current period. Ents of T 
which is subscript T, represents the population of young. N sub T minus 1 is the population of old. So capital N denotes our population. You can have growing population, decreasing population, constant. All of that comes later. This is all just a setup for the model. The, when the model begins, there's always going to be a group of initial old people. They only care about consuming in this period because next period they won't exist anymore. Um, that's very important and very critical to the model. You also need an infinite time horizon for this to work. Um, you'll understand why later on, but that is very critical to the model working. Um, it's essentially part of the reasoning of the fiat money systems and how they work. So the US dollar is no longer currently backed by gold or silver or any other precious metal. It's only backed by the full faith of the US government. And that essentially guarantees us an infinite time horizon in real life. Um, the US government never has and never will default on any of its debt. And this is essentially covering that aspect of it. Fiat money is only worth something if you believe it has value. And that's how the US dollar holds its value fundamentally aside from everything else that happens uh, in the forex market and whatnot. So agents preferences, there's only one commodity in this simple example. So agents want to consume the sole commodity. They don't have any choice. You can introduce choice later. It really doesn't matter. Your consumption bundle can be made up of what you consume today, what you save for tomorrow, etc. Investments, they can all get bundled into your consumption bundle. Um, don't get caught up on the small details. They really do not matter. And if you understand the fundamentals, you can add, you can think about it however you want later on. Um, the only other preference they have is to obtain satisfaction. So in this model, when you're young, you have a bunch of food, but you can't save it for when you get old. The food expires, it goes bad, etc. So to obtain satisfaction in both periods, you have to find some way to consume food when you're old in the next period. Um, that is what we're essentially trying to accomplish using money in this example. Um, I skipped over the section that covers the benevolent planner to find the optimal allocation. It's pretty simple to understand. Uh, if I need to make a video on it, I will. This is post that. So the benevolent planner decides how to allocate goods between young and old people in the most optimal way. Um, very simple explanation, but it's not too complicated. And then you have four assumptions for this model to hold. This is another very important part of any economic model, um, are the assumptions. So when you're talking logic or anything else, you always need axioms, which are the most simple fundamental fact that you're agreeing on when you step into any model. So an axiom means you understand and agree with the facts that are being laid out or the assumptions that are being used to then build upon for the model or for logic or whatever it is you're doing. The four in this case are preferences are complete, preferences are transitive. You don't necessarily need to understand what those mean right now. You will as we go on. But that's similar to a lot of microeconomic theory and macroeconomic theory. Preferences are just what they are. Um, you, as a person, have individual preferences um, that are different from the next person and such. So you make decisions based off of your preferences. Um, the third assumption, more is better than less. So 
again, right now we only have two goods, but you can expand this to having multiple goods, or you could have savings, or cash, or food, or future consumption, or future investment, whatever it might be. This is not necessarily critical, but it holds that all agents want to have more. They want to consume more. It's not consumption in the literal sense, but it is important to not forget that more is always preferred to less. And the fourth, probably most important assumption, is diminishing marginal utility. Uh, there's diminishing marginal utility across all of economics. It basically just covers the fact that more of something is only better up to a point. So, if you have one jar of peanut butter and one jar of jelly, nine more jars of peanut butter doesn't help you any much more unless you have nine more jars of jelly. Because you don't want just a peanut butter sandwich. Um, it applies to money. So one dollar to a millionaire is way less valuable than one dollar to somebody that has zero dollars. The principle holds. Um, you can get deeper into the theory as to why it holds, but all you have to know is that things stop being less valuable as you have more of such good, whatever it might be. Over here, we have a basic indifference curve. On the x-axis, we have consumption of good 1, consumption of good 2. So these are just the values. Again, none of the actual numbers in any of these cases matter. This is not drawn to scale. Um, don't worry too much about the numbers or the size or the shape. You just have to understand what it represents and how you use it. So an indifference curve tells you anywhere along the curve you have the same amount of utility. Utility in economics is basically a measure of satisfaction based off of your preferences. But in the sense that anywhere along the curve you are just as well off. have more consumption good 2 and less of 1, you're just as okay relative to having a lot of 1 and a little bit of 2, or somewhere in the middle where you have an equal balance of both. In economic theory, consumers enjoy having more options, so somewhere in the middle is always preferred to the extremes. Another important thing is this arrow coming from the x-axis. This is just a line of y equals x. So it's a perfectly straight line coming from the origin of 45 degrees. This is just saying that the expansion path of utility is increasing in this direction. So a higher indifference curve out here is a higher level of utility everywhere. So when you're on an indifference curve, you can be at any point along the curve and still have the same amount of utility, which means you are just as well off. And that is defined by your preferences. So that's, this is increasing utility, subscript N. This is a utility line one. You could just there's technically an infinite amount of utility curves in this x-y coordinate. So you could have more. They all have the same shape and scale, and they grow outwards. So this has the highest utility relative to these four. You really only use this visually when you're comparing utility functions or utility graphs or indifference curves, I mean. So if one's further out than another, it's always preferred. It's that simple. A utility or indifference curves can never cross, so they're all 
They're not parallel, but they'll never touch. That's something you can go deeper into, but it's not required currently. Okay, I'm going to erase this and move on to the functional equations that you use to solve this model. Um, I'll leave the more important parts 